Hello, again, and welcome to episode 6 of Bonus Action, a Duels of Mandalore supplement podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we're the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And we have our good friend Wyatt, the typical Gemini here. Hello, Wyatt. Hey, guys. Who are neither <laughs> brothers nor in a dungeon. No, no. You're, you're a brother from another mother, I would say, at this point. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Do we, we can absorb you into our uh, oh. collective. Ooh. Exactly. I I think I have most reoccurring guests so far. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Not even not even close. It's not even kind of. All close. right. Well, <laughs> we've had we've, we've had Ivy on twice. Ivy now on this twice. is Wyatt's third time. Wyatt's third time. We did RPD once. Yeah. Everyone else has been once. Yeah. Well, good for you. Look at you. Look at yeah. you. Well, we we want Wyatt. We want. Oh, we want you, Wyatt. We want Wyatt. We want Wyatt. Well, we're going to have Wyatt on the podcast more regularly. <laughs> we're going to be doing set reviews for Magic the Gathering sets as they come out. He's a fun little person to talk to. We might bring in other people at some point, maybe get maybe get our, our CEDH buddy Lincoln in a little bit from a CEDH perspective. But, you know, we'll we'll play that. We'll, we'll, we'll game that out as time goes on. But we're here to talk about Bloomboro today, the most recent Magic the Gathering set. Uh, as of the recording of this, we are past pre-release and we are mm -hmm. going into release weekend over Gen Con. Uh, we're going to try and get this posted as quickly as possible. So ideally before or like right when we're leaving for Gen Con is when we're going to try and post this. So Excellent. if it's not then when this goes live, sorry. <laughs> but... <laughs> We've got uh, a lot of things to talk about today with Bloomborough. We're going to start, uh, of course, the theme of Bloomborough. All of the magical creatures, all critters, every single being on this plane is a creature, and even uh, humanoids that go to that plane then become creatures as well. Mm -hmm. The otters, the rats, all of that kind of stuff. You are a big fan of the art, Wyatt. I know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The alter I mean, just if you even take the alternate arts out, like a lot of this art is just very reminiscent of... Like, uh, I've heard Redwall being thrown around, and yeah. uh, that was, like, a, a big movie in my childhood, and it just kind of reminds me of, like, uh, I think it's Don Bluth movies, like, really oh, early, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. like, really late 90s animated mm -hmm. movies, and then the alternate art just takes that up to a whole other level. It's giving, like, a little bit of Studio Ghibli in there. Not, like, a ton. The alternate arts, I feel like, are more Studio Ghibli. But, yeah, I, it, it's a beautiful set in terms of art. Um, we're not... I like the fancy arts, obviously. I mean, everyone sure. likes the fancy art. Sure. I will say, I love what they did with the basic land cycle. And thank the Lord, they're all full arts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you can't pull a regular basic land from the set. And then each basic land has effectively the same art, but ju just uh, different seasons. Which yeah. I think is really cute. Back um, in my day, we only got full art lands on Zendikar, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, in our day, every set has full art lands, but it's exceptionally frustrating that only some of the lands you get are full art. Yeah, can you imagine if they commissioned, what, five times, 420 separate full art pieces, and then they're like, but there's only a chance you get one in every 15 packs of getting a full art, whatever it is. Whatever the chances are. It's Watsy. Right? I mean, yeah. I, I don't see why they don't just make all lands full art lands and then just have, like, your regular, normal-looking lands as, like, land packs. Yeah. I feel like that just made... Uh, I don't know. Or, like, make them in the pre-cons and, like, pre-constructed stuff gets the normal stuff. And if you're buying booster packs where you're spending the money yeah. and they're making a lot of money. Or that new us. value booster pack or whatever. Oh, my called. God. I didn't want to bring it up. <laughs> Well, that's too bad. We're going to have to bring it up. <laughs> so they introduced the value pack for Bloomborough, which is, I believe, seven cards. So one mm -hmm. more or two more than an aftermath booster. So there's value. Value. No guaranteed rare or mythic. You are basically only guaranteed commons and uncommons from the set. And then there's a chance for a rare, a mythic rare, or a... Um, one of the special guests. One of the special guests, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, Wyatt, please explain to us why this is a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, because I feel like they're adopting more of a model of, like, Arena, where mm -hmm. when you get your pack, it's like, you get a random wild card. And I feel like it's just kind of backtracking, because they eliminated, I believe it was Play Boosters originally. 
They put they put uh, the play booster in in place of draft and set boosters. They basically combined them. Right. So they like they basically took a draft booster and then increased the chance a little bit for um, nicer arts, effectively, or basically just put mm-hmm. in the special treatments and special guest cards into draft boosters, and then they called it play boosters. Right. Uh, to Which simplify. Is, uh, uh, yeah, super. It's a it's a huge disservice. I feel because. That would trip a lot of people up. Like if people were buying me cards, I'd always yeah. get a phone call and they'd be like, "Are you? Do you want a set, a set booster or a draft booster?" I'm like, "I don't know which one. A set booster, <laughs> just whichever one's cheaper for you. You're buying me cards, yeah, literally. Uh, and what, what and the then value? They, and then they oh, combine bad. it and get rid of it, and then they're just like, and I thought that was a great thing going forward. Is like less mm-hmm. product means exactly. it's going to be more focused for the players and the people buying for the magic player in their life. And then they're like, actually let's bring back a value pack. And it's, it's giving the same vibe that you would get from those packs where you like go into Walmart and they're just repacks where it's just yes. like this cheap plastic shell with magic, the gathering cards in it. And it's like guaranteed one foil. Yeah. yeah. It's like, okay, well it's a, it's a foil disenchant. So that's like ten cents. Thank you. Yeah, love and, that. And their whole thing was they're like, well, it's for the it's for the p- player who wants to still get the full experience of of you know the of the set without having to pay as much. And it's like, cool. I mean, a booster pack's what like five dollars, six dollars. Yeah. Uh, you can't draft with it, so you're not getting a draft experience. You can't do a limited no. pool with it, so you're not getting a pre-release experience. And you're not going to be guaranteed any of the powerful cards, so you're not going to be able to get, like, the opening a pack experience of, like, ooh, what's the rare going to be? What's that little, the mythic going to be? That little hit of serotonin from the gamble. Yeah. Exactly. The le- it's, it genuinely seems like an attempt to, like, confuse parents and grandparents that are just buying cards for their kids or people that don't know what they're doing. Because I don't see... That's my conspiracy theory. Like, I think that Watsy made the play booster and then they were saw a dip in sales and they were like why is this happening oh people aren't getting confused with which boosters are which anymore so we need to throw something out there let's make mm. something for the poors they'll never <laughs> know the difference well it's it's literally the oh you're in line at walmart and there's the one aisle that has a register that has all the cards on it yeah because that's where they put all the playing cards for some reason and yeah. or the tcg i don't they make weird decisions. Uh, but it's like, oh, we're there. Oh, I'll just grab... Oh, this one's $4. I'll grab that one. Yeah. That's literally all it is. Because there's... If you're playing Magic the Gathering, like, you're not going to be buying this product for, like, any no. reason. You can't buy a box of value boosters, I don't think. No, I don't think so. So... For me, it's it, like a super slap in the face because most people, like, when they talk about making it value for people who are trying to spend less... That's literally what budget decks are for. Yeah. Literally. People who build budget decks are just probably going to buy singles from whatever, you know, they're not mm-hmm. buying packs, they're buying singles. So yeah. you're, you've made a product that is designed for people who specifically buy singles. Mm-hmm. Now, if they were, here's a $4 pack with a guaranteed rare or mythic, with a full art land, with a guaranteed token, why the fuck we aren't guaranteeing tokens? is beyond me. I hate that I hate that they combined this is a side tangent. I hate that they combined the tokens and the art cards and the ad cards into one slot. Mm-hmm. And now you it's just like, oh, I would really like a uh, I'd really like a food token because this card says gift a tapped food or gift a food. We didn't get a food out of like 18, what, 18, 18 plus six. Six. Four or eighteen plus five, twenty-two packs. We didn't get a single food token. We got one fish. That's right? crazy. One fish for the tapped fish, and it's we got a couple. I mean, we got a couple of the cool like offspring tokens, which is yeah. nice to have. Some and I feel like those are gonna go. Complete sidebar. I feel like those offspring tokens are gonna go the way of um, oh, what are the the like oddly specific like cards that make a one off token and then those tokens mm-hmm. are worth like eight dollars like the like the uh, fable of the mirror breaker yes the only yes. thing that makes that goblin cleric yeah the gob is it goblin cleric goblin it's a goblin, goblin shaman. shaman goblin shaman that when you attack or the you... shrines for the shrines, yeah exactly exactly so I feel like those are gonna so that'll be fun but 
a va like the ideal value pack, let's say it's seven cards, one guaranteed rare or mythic, full art land. I'll even I'll even give them the benefit of the doubt. We'll just say the full art land is one of the seven cards. Ooh, scandalous. Three uncommons, three commons, four dollars. I feel like that's a fine pack. It's nothing yeah. crazy. It's from a full set, so you're not going to have like the aftermath or Assassin's Creed problem of you're buying a seven dollar pack and then you're getting the same cards over and over again, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. just because the pool is limited. Like it's the whole pool of Bloomborough. And if you just want to pick up like a cheap pack, like you're at least guaranteed a rare mythic, you can get a token out of it and call it good. Right. But I, I, I feel that's also just going another way of that's like a slap in the face to players because yeah. old, like when you go back, Magic the Gathering packs used to be three to four dollars and you would get 15 cards. Yeah. You know, and it, it used to be these specialty products that would be the yeah. expensive packs like your Modern Horizons or Double Masters. <laughs> Uh, things like that, You're and it's just right in the odd of to to be point. in this dystopian where we're talking about a value pack, and we're like, oh well, we'd be happy with six cards and one rare for four dollars. This is just what they want. Literally, literally. Also, Hashtag shrinkflation. Also, give Sam a hard time the next time he coughs right in the middle of your conversation. That's very rude. It's very rude. <laughs> I'll just get it's rid all of good. my um, innards. All of them. Yep, every single one of them. Just get rid of them. The larynx. My southern hospitality will not allow me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm born, I was born in Kentucky. Fuck the hospitality. I'm from Ohio. My point exactly. Um, I don't know what that was, but... <laughs> all right, so... That's the Ohio sign. <laughs> Literally, the Ohio sign. This is what a book guy does. Uh, something, something, it's giving Ohio. Is that what the kids say now? I feel like they're saying that. Like it's a very, it's Skibbity like you Ohio got, Riz. You got that Skibbity Ohio Riz, exactly. I think I just had a brain aneurysm. <laughs> okay. All right. So value packs are like the one bad thing about Bloomboro, if we're being completely yes. honest. Pretty much everything else about this set is probably setting it up to be the best set of the year at this point. I would argue that. At least so far. I mean, Modern Horizons 3, obviously the power level is a lot higher. Mm -hmm. But the cost is a lot higher on it as well. It's a lot not as accessible as Bloomboro. As far as like regular sets go, Bloomboro yeah. is the standout so far. And I would even say the standout going forward, because I mean there are people obviously that are big fans of like the Duskmorn style, like you are, and Foundations is just a core set. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean especially uh, the the earlier sets in the year, especially like Ravnica, uh uh Ravnica goes murdering. Uh, just was just such a middling set, just like so, oh, so not good. It, yeah. <laughs> Like it, it, let's it, let's be fair. That was just to sell the clue game, okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, they could have just made the clue pack, and the clue package is like neat. Okay, fine, whatever. Reprint, reprint the shock lands in that. Yeah. And they did. You get a guaranteed shock for the fucking clue box, whatever. But, it's just, but it's like they did so much with food last year, the food token, like between uh, Eldraine and Lord of the Rings, and then they're like, let's do more with the clue token. I was like, that sounds cool. They got, like, two cool cards out of the entire set that dealt with artifacts like that. That investigated, even. That yeah. really, like, even created clue tokens. There weren't a lot of things making clue tokens. There's a lot of things making two two detectives. Yeah. There's a uh, actually, th I think they're called the Inquisitive Gorgons or Investigative Gorgons. The ones where you cra if you sacrifice an artifact or a clue or something like mm -hmm. that, you, you're, people get two poison counters. Yeah. That was, like, interesting. Yeah, Crime the novelist. <laughs> Uh, Crime novelist. Hands rig, and that's about it. Those are the three yeah. that stand out in my mind as far as I would argue. Crime novelist in the first show. one, really. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah. Anz rag is a is a neat uh, is a neat card. I'm just I'm as long as we don't get more Anz rags, because like they have a habit of doing that where they're like, hey, this this was a really cool card that we made. Let's make it in different colors now. And mm. yeah, I could see that. Like that unblock. It's Anz rag is very gruel. We very don't, gruel. Yeah, 100%. We don't, yeah, we don't need that in, like, Selesnia. No. You say that. You say that. I say that, but we don't. But we might see it in Selesnia. Who knows, you know? I wouldn't mind that. I like Selesnia. I like that a lot of the Ravnica, like, old gods that they're called or whatever are usually in Gruul or Green. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All but right. Anyway. This bypassing that. Then we go to Outlaws of Thunder Junction, Cowboys. Yeehaw! Now. Haw. That I mean again. I, I liked that set. I liked the theme of the set. The theme it's it's weirder. It's 
but it's not set on Ravnica, so it's not <laughs> like weird that doesn't make sense in a set that, in a setting we already know. And right. the card, like the card quality on one-off basis with the ca- individual cards, was just higher. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like in even the set specific mechanics, like plot has its, has a pretty good use. Spree having modality with spells is interesting. You've got a lot it's of nice interesting... to see all the villains. Exactly, you get interesting commanders even with like Riku with the modal spells and uh, Obeka like creating another the new Obeka steps, is really cool. Multiple upkeep steps for all the upkeep triggers. Like it's just interesting. It, it makes new things. But for me, bringing it back, Bloomborough, yes. I think is the set to beat this year in terms oh, of yeah. just regular Magic sets. Yeah, like I would agree. Far and away. Uh, but let's get into Bloomborough and some of the mechanics. So each of the color pairs, all ten of them, they have a, a specific creature type that is associated with them. Uh, white blue birds, blue black rats, black red lizards, red green raccoons, green white rabbits, or I guess Ang- Anzrags as well. The- <laughs> Anzrags for- rule. Moles. Yeah. Or, or for or for Celestia as well. Uh, <laughs> The, the <laughs> white black is bats, blue red otters, black green is obviously squirrels, red white is mice, and then green blue is frogs. And each of those creature types synergize with one another, and they also synergize with a couple of other creature types across all of the uh, all of the various card types. Usually, the ones that share a pairing with them. Yes. Yes. So raccoons, uh, raccoons, otters, mice, and lizards will usually reference each other. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you can see that with the uncommon land cycle in the villages that tap for colorless, and then they tap for an individual color only to cast creature spells, and then they have another activated ability on them that references the creature types that are associated with that color as well, and you can get a benefit out of them. Those are really good in pre-release and limited specifically for Bloomborough stuff, and I don't see that uncommon land cycle seeing much, if any, play outside of that specific setting. Would you oh, say yeah. so? Why? I, 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 oh, one hundred percent. This is these are going to be lands that you probably should pick up while you can, because mm-hmm. I guarantee, because of what you just said, the ability to reprint them. Like over time, this is just going to be one of those things that just steadily creeps up, and then you're going to go to buy one, and it's going to be like a ten or fifteen dollar card for like no reason, even. Yeah, and it all it's going to take is it's going to take like that one mouse creature that's really good Mm -hmm. or the one bat that's really good that wants that card yeah some like the i believe the black one because it has rats in it or or Mm -hmm. something like that might uh, might be one that sees a little bit of play outside of the limited environment but the other they're just so weird to trigger too that secondary ability is it's like it enters the battlefield or or uh, you just have one for some of them. Yeah, and sometimes you have to sack the land, but I don't think you have to sack them on all of them. You only get the colored mana specifically for creature spells, so you need to be in low color decks that want to cast a lot of creatures. And then you can get the colored mana, and the creature types have to be associated with the it, secondary ability. It's. Yeah. I don't well, know. I'm I just going to say, fine. I'm going to call it now Mudflat Village. Is yeah. definitely going to be like the one that stands out because rats are already a very established, mm-hmm. like tribe or typal uh, yeah. of card. That and the and, green one for squirrels specifically as well. The black. Yeah, one yeah, squirrel. like Chatterfang and uh, Toski. Yeah, yeah the, but you know, um, Maronar is one of the most popular rat commanders. Will probably yeah. continue to be so. It's a lightning rod for removal. Having two mana and sacrifice a land to get it back into your hand saves you two mana on a, or yeah. four mana extra. There, they'll, they'll be fine utility lands in very specific cases, is the thing. That's true. Uh, moving on, let's go over the set-specific mechanics for Bloomborough. We got six fun ones here. Five of them are new. The returning one is Threshold. You're seeing that a lot on blue and black cards. Of course, that's when you have seven or more cards in your graveyard. You have an additional effect. We've seen Threshold before. The new ones, Offspring... Uh, Offspring is effectively kicker. Lincoln will hate that, but it's true. It is effectively kicker. Uh, For example, we look at the Tender Wild Guide. It's the rare mana dork from this set. Uh, One and a green for a 2-2 Possum Druid. It has Offspring 2, where you can pay uh, an additional 2 mana as you cast the spell. And if you do, 
When this creature enters, you create a 1-1 token copy of it. So basically, you're just paying an additional cost and then getting an additional copy of that creature, except it's a Mm -hmm. 1-1. So this is generally going to be useful for abusing enters the battlefield effects, um, as well as more static abilities like the Tender Wild Guide, where you can tap for a mana of any color, or you can tap to put a plus one, plus one counter on it. Um, As far as variations of the kicker keyword, I think this one is very interesting. Uh, They did make, as as I said earlier, they made specific tokens for every single one of the offspring cards as well. Little babby tokens. Yes, especially for some of the cards that are more uh, powerful, particularly my brain goes to the Coruscation Mage. We got the token for it. We didn't get the Coruscation Mage. And I feel like that's one that's going to randomly be worth like twelve dollars in the in the future. Um, I feel what do you like think once of this is standard, it's going to start just yeah spiking these cards. But offspring, I love it. Uh, I'm a huge token guy. Usually, I make bigger tokens. Yeah. But one of the things I often run into when I'm trying to make budget decks and stuff is I want to take like a populate theme. Mm-hmm. This is that. Like it's the perfect thing. It's a card that can come with a token. Mm-hmm. And then you can take that token and populate it. And that's all I really want to do with all of these. <laughs> populate is a mechanic I would love to see more of. Absolutely. Yeah. With, especially with all the, like Offspring, all the things that are making super powerful, like, one-off tokens. So if you just get more of, are ridiculously powerful. What do you think, Sam? Let's not forget that, like, in Commander, one of the best things to do is to make multiple with, like, Doubling Season. Yep. Uh, Mondrak. Yeah. Uh, Ohir Tack all these things that double or triple the tokens and now you're paying that offspring cost and you're coming in with three so you've just made a mana dork and three other mana dorks Mm -hmm. yeah i the offspring for me it's like on two ends it's like one it's really cool for a lot of them like the intrepid rabbit in in exactly the situation why it's talking about making yeah two three four and then just keep going that because every time that enters the battlefield you get a plus one counter on something uh, they get plus one, plus one till end of turn. Oh. Okay, so plus one, plus one till end of turn. Still good. You just paid four mana, f- you know, if you have an O'Hare talk, let's say, you just paid four mana to give everything plus four, plus four until the end of turn. That's not a bad rate. Okay. And you can possibly repeat that in the future. However, the, the, the other side of it is there's a lot of ones that are really bad. Oh, there's a lot. They're, like, over-costed. Um, there's the one creature that's like Dark Confidant that yeah, people are talking Dark about. That one. And that one, if the offspring costs were like one less, I feel like it would be a lot better. <laughs> but it's just so expensive to get some of those online. And then there's the blue otter that we pulled like three of that's a rare that kind of sucks. Uh, yeah. I'm going to get my card out. You start talking, Wyatt. <laughs> yeah. Uh,. I don't. I think offspring is going to be a great mechanic. I think it's really good because oftentimes um, that just guarantees that later in the game, if you draw these cards, they're not dead. That's because true. now you can pay the extra mana and get more of them. Thundertrap uh, Trainer was the one that I was thinking of. One and a blue for a one-two Otter Wizard with offspring four. Offspring four. So whoa. two mana to get its enters enters effect by itself, or six mana to get double the enters effects and it's look at the top four cards of your library you can reveal a non-creature non-land put it into your hand put the rest in the bottom in a random order so like a nice little top deck manipulation a little extra card draw on a two mana creature is not bad but getting but spending four more mana to do that twice i don't see nearly as valuable i think it, that's mostly like a standard thing um yeah because oftentimes uh I've watched a lot more standard recently, especially uh, Shuffle Up and Plays. Most yeah, recent was a episode. was a standard where they all went against Reed Duke, uh, and hilarious. that really showed that you can just end up with so much mana and not a lot of cards in hand. So that yeah. card selection can be huge, and especially top decking this, and then being able to pay six and go eight cards deep. Mm-hmm. Sam, you pulled I, out I just realized that I, I pulled both a offspring creature and its token. Hey, look so I, I'm pretty cool. I, I, that's just a cool thing I just realized. Um, there was one that I got that I was not... I got it twice. And I'm not particularly like interested. It's it's the Paw Patch Recruiter. It's one green with offspring two. Uh, it has a 2-1 with trample. And whenever a creature you control becomes the target of a spell or ability, a, a, an opponent controls... 
put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control other than that creature. Um, like that's an all right ability. There's I'm not against that ability. Your your opponent targets something on your board, you get to put some plus one counters on that on another creature. I'm fine with that. However, that's a rare. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. not that common of an ability, I guess, especially in, in or like that's... I think this might just, as why it was saying, I think it might just be our commander bias showing. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Honestly. Uh, that's, that's how it is for a lot. Sometimes I have to really sit back and analyze mm -hmm. because I often find myself going through and people will be like super hyped about a rare or an uncommon and I'm just like, this does nothing for commander. True. Yeah. You well, know, keep on going. People out there, if you are interested in a foil pat paw patch, paw patch, paw patch. <laughs> recruiter, or whatever it was, warrior, let me know. I'll sell it to you. Yeah, DM us. All right, we'll uh, move it's on. It's got a it, relevant type in warrior. That is true. That is true. Uh, Nijela will like that. Nijela? Cool. Is it I don't Nijela? know. I think she's the one that makes warriors. I can't remember if it's Nijela or someone else. Anyway, regardless, uh, do you have anything else you want to say on Offspring, gentlemen? I'm good. All right. Gift. Wrap it up, kids. Gift. Get, oh. Gift. That's a sex joke. Gift is the next mechanic. Uh, gift. Kicker, but not with mana. G yeah. <laughs> gift. Uh, when you cast the spell, you may pro promise an opponent a gift as you cast it. If you do, uh, they do the thing, and then you get an additional benefit. So, for example, the one that I really like is Crumb and Get It. Uh, it's the one mana white instant that if you do not do the gift, uh, you, creature just gets plus two, plus two until the end of turn. But you can gift a food, in which case a target opponent gets a food token, uh, and then the targeted creature also gains indestructible in addition to the two, two. I like it because there's a bat wielding a baguette, which yeah. I find very entertaining. Uh, but For there... gift? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go no, ahead. No, no, carry on. He talks too much anyway. Go on. Not true. I was just going to say, Cruel Claws Heist is mm -hmm. the one for me that I'm, like, most psyched about when talking about gift because not only am I getting to look at your hand, I'm taking something away, and I will get to cast the card. In addition, you're drawing a card from your deck, so I'm adding to your hand, so I'm adding to the options yeah. that I'm going to be able to look at and take yeah. away. That is, that is, like, the sneakiest use of gift a card specifically. So the, main, the ones that we've seen for gift are gifting a food, gifting a card, and gifting a tapped fish. There are two more in the commander products, yeah. which are gift an extra turn and gift an 8-8 octopus. Yeah, those are obvious. I know. Obviously weird commander things, but the main ones you're going to be encountering are gift a card where a target opponent draws a card, gift a food where they create a food token, and gift a tapped fish where they get a tapped 1-1 one, one blue fish. With Cruel Claws Heist, I, I agree. I saw them play it in the standard for sh in the standard games for Shuffle Up and Play, and it did a lot of work because gifting that card forces them to draw an additional card. So in a way, you are thought-seizing the top of their deck as well, yes. which is hilarious. Uh, yeah, that's one of the better. That's one of the better gift ones. Most of the ones, uh, in terms of a commander context, gifting a tapped fish, I feel like is going to be the least costly one in most circumstances. Uh, gifting a card in a two-player format is really tough to ask someone to do that, and uh, with the exception of the cruel claw heist, because you're just getting another option of a card to get rid of from mm -hmm. their deck, and by mm -hmm. gifting it, you're able to use it. So you might be able to take their best card. Uh, which right. in one of the games happened. <laughs> yeah. They've closed out the game uh, from for a shuffle up and play. Uh, Starfall Invocation is one as well that I like a lot as the three white white sorcery where you gift a card. Uh, and this is in a commander context specifically. One player is going to get an additional card. You're destroying all the creatures, but then you get your best creature back onto the battlefield. Or better yet, your creature that has the best enters the battlefield or death trigger back onto the mm -hmm. battlefield uh, because it does actually hit the graveyard and then return and not isn't just shielded from the board wipe as well. Oh, yeah. I'll gladly give somebody a card for that effect. Yeah. It's, it's one of the better destroy all creature board wipes we've seen in a while. And usually on, on white, white recursion, we usually see like some restriction of like mana value three or less, power two or less. No, this is just... Add a finality Add, counter or something. Yeah, this is just... But this is a blanket. Yeah, it just gets it back. It's a, basically Flicker. <laughs> flicker that gets rid of everything else. Yeah, I'll destroy everything and get my commander back. I... Uh, 
The problem is, is right now it seems to be pretty pricey, but I might even get that for, like, Abdel Adrian, because if I can shove everything under him and then destroy him, but then recur him <laughs> and get everything yep. back and then wipe the board, that's probably that one curse. of the best board wipes. It's all board. upside. It's all upside. <laughs> it's, all, I, it's a win-win, baby. It's a win-win. All right. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say about Gift? The only thing that makes me sad about Gift is I'm I'm one of those – another thing, aside from theft, I really like to do is group hug. So Gift mm-hmm. Card is like something that's right up my alley where I'm like trying to gain political favor and be like, hey, I'll let you draw a card. You know, maybe you don't attack me or, hey, remember I let you get that blue fish, so now we're friends, right? You need, you need, a, you need uh, a blocker on your next turn. Exactly. Uh, the only thing that makes me sad about that is this mechanic is so cool but we will probably not see it again. It's going to be one of those like energy counter things where it pops up very randomly. They'll sprinkle it in on other products, but for the most part, it's it's done for. You will not see it again. I yeah. to- I totally expect them to return to Bloomboro though. I mean, it's hard to say when one yeah, we don't see we they they plan 3 years in the future. So like, yeah, we do know a lot of sets that are well, not really actually at this point. We knew a lot of sets at one point. Yeah. And now we're we're still we're just in code names. I mean, mm-hmm. we know some of the universes beyond, but yeah, I could see. I would like yeah, that's a good. It's a decent mechanic that I think could be built more. In the context of of not just the fact that like it's interesting as a mechanic when you're playing one v one, like do I really want to give you this thing for a small benefit effect beneficial effect? Like I we were playing when we were playing pre release uh, last night last night oh god i had several options where i had several cards where it's like gift a tapped fish i'm like well i'm not going to do that because you have two things that two soul sisters basically on board Mm -hmm. so it's like do i want to give you a body and two two life just to get a pump a two plus two pump on my creature no but then in a different context yeah it's it opens up group hug more to uh to offer you know he's like okay i want to do things to you you get a benefit um yeah, so we'll. I guess we'll see what happens. Maybe it's sprinkled in here or there, but yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't see it returning in a major way mm-hmm. anytime soon. In in the way that Offspring is more like a standard mechanic, a standard format mechanic, I feel like Gift is going to have a better home in Commander, mm-hmm. where gifting effectively a third of a card to your opponents, averaged out, is much better than gifting one whole card to your direct opponent. Yeah. Plus, right. someone's always behind. You can always yeah. just gift the card to the person that's behind. That's like a gesture of goodwill. They'll probably mm-hmm. remember that later. Or they continue to do nothing, and you didn't give it to either one of the other players who were a threat. That's exactly. true. Yeah. Exactly. You see a lot of that in CDH where, like, someone someone has an explosive turn one play, and then everyone else just blows them up. Yeah. And then they just can't really come back. And it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to tap this Rainbow Land. Uh, you can have the 1-1 Spirit. Sure. <laughs> and then I can never remember the name of that land. Uh Forbidden Orchard? Forbidden Orchard. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, you can have the one one. It's fine. Don't worry about it. You're <laughs> yeah. not going to win this game. <laughs> it's All irrelevant. Right. I'm going to win this turn. Yeah, yeah, literally. That's another one. All right, I'll move on. We'll move on to Forage. Forage uh, is a mechanic, obviously, right. where you can do one of two things. You can choose to exile three cards from your graveyard or sacrifice a food, and then the cards that have the Forage mechanic on that will give you a benefit of some kind. For example, the Corpseberry Cultivator is one Golgari Golgari. It's a 2-3 Squirrel Warlock. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may forage. Whenever you forage, you put a plus one plus one counter on the Corpseberry Cultivator. Or, for example, the Tree Chop Sentries. Three green, three and a green for a 2-4 Squirrel Archer with reach. When it enters, you may forage. If you do, you draw a card. Uh, so effectively, in a set where you're making food tokens, being able to get rid of those food tokens without having to pay the mana to just gain life and you get additional value out of them mm-hmm. is going to be nice. Uh, even if you don't have the food tokens, you can still choose to forage by just getting rid of some stuff in your graveyard you don't need. Uh, a bit of a niche mechanic, I think definitely exclusive to Standard and this set specifically. Uh, though I could see someone that's like souped up their uh, Lord of the Rings food commander deck would see some value in some of these forage cards. Oh, absolutely, or a Guillaume Master Chef. Anything that's making mm-hmm. food is going to love Forage, because other than that, one thing people do not like is having to exile cards from their graveyard. Yeah. Because see, that means it's gone forever. 
I'm kind of the opposite. For I, the most part. Uh, in my decks that I'm putting a bunch of things in the graveyard, there's going to be a bunch of things that I don't care are in the graveyard. There's seven basic lands. I don't care. I'm not, I, I, you know, my mono black deck, I have no way of recurring those lands easily. So I really like this, uh, like Feed the Cycle is probably one of my favorite cards um, from, like, one. I think it's a common, it's, uh, or actually, no, I take it back. It's, it's an, an uncommon. uncommon. It's okay. one in a black, as an additional cost to cast the spell, forage or pay a black, uh, and to forage, exile three cards from your graveyard, or sacrifice food, destroy target creature, or planeswalker. I think that's the best forage card. Mm-hmm. And again, it's like, I don't, I, I'm milling myself. I'm gonna have so many cards that I don't, I don't need that one that one mana that two mana engine piece because I already have three of them out. So I'll just get rid of that and two basic lands, and now I get this ability. You know, didn't have to necessarily sacrifice a creature, which I usually do. Or I didn't have to exile a creature. That yeah, I, it's it I, in its worst case scenario, feed the cycle is an instant speed murder that can hit a planeswalker, mm-hmm. and then in its best case scenario, it's an instant speed. Um, Oh my god, Doom Blade that can hit yeah. a creature that can hit a creature or a planeswalker. Any hey. creature or any planeswalker. So an instant speed fell also from this set. <laughs> yeah. You know, Sir uh ooh, now I'm forgetting his name. The mono black Sir S Y R. Sir Conrad. Sir Conrad will love this. Oh yeah. He loves things leaving. Anyway. Oh yeah. I mean there's always gonna be decks that wanna use it, but for the most part a lot of graveyard decks that would have a full enough graveyard to take advantage of the exiling mm-hmm. probably don't want to exile much. Even in, even in Golgari colors, it's hard to do that now because before there was only maybe two or three things that would get all your lands out of your graveyard, but that's now that's true. like an honest strategy because there's so many things that get mm-hmm. all your lands back. So all this milling, you're just going to fill that board up so fast. Yeah, and if you're in a strategy where you're wanting to do that, then sure, you don't want Forage, but there are still plenty of strategies that are going to be dumping cards into the graveyard to get one-offs out or get individual recursion out that this thing can fit into. Mm-hmm. So, narrow, yes, but I still think pretty good. Definitely pretty better good. in sets and decks that are going to be making food, obviously. But Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah, the food's going to be the strong one. And I think this might... Um... We were talking about this last night on the live. Uh, you know, you always go through these phases of learning things in Magic, and one of them, one of the big hurdles I think is when you start to learn how to use your graveyard. That's not just a trash can. Yeah, it's like yeah, you can recur, but also this yeah, and and uh, for new players to be like able to grab something cheap that you can use this graveyard in a, as a secondary resource will be a very good lesson to learn. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Eat the graveyard. Eat the cream. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. tasty. Moving on, we have Valiant. Valiant is going to mostly be on the mice uh, in red and white. Valiant reads. It, it's not really a key. It is a keyword. It's kind of like heroic in a way. You want to be targeting your creature with a spell or an ability, but unlike heroic, you can use an ability to target it. And unlike heroic, it is only uh, once per turn. Turn. Yes, for, yeah. for the first time each turn. So, for example, if we look at one of the rares here that I wish I had pulled, uh, Emberheart Challenger. It is one and a red for a 2-2 Mouse Warrior with haste and prowess. Two of my favorite keywords. They are. Especially on a mono-red body. It also has Valiant. Whenever Emberheart Challenger becomes the target of a spell or ability you control for the first time each turn, exile the top card of your library until the end of your... Until the end of your turn, you may play that card. Uh, another example is the uncommon Mouse Trapper. Two and a white for a 3-2 Mouse Soldier with Flash. Whenever Mouse Trapper becomes the target of a spell or ability you control for the first time each turn, tap target creature and opponent control. So, in a way, it's like Heroic from Theros, where you want to be targeting your creature or have your creature be targeted by stuff uh, that you do. Uh, it opens it up so it doesn't have to be spells anymore. It can be abilities, too. There's plenty of tap to add a counter mm-hmm. or activate an ability to target a creature. Those are all going to trigger Valiant. Uh, but its limitation is that it can only happen once per turn. Which you can choose to do it on other people's turns as well, if yep. you have a way to repeat it. If you want to get multiple right. turn cycle. Um, I love the heroic mechanic from Theros. I'm obviously a little bit biased 
because that was the first set that I played of Magic. Uh, I really like my Feather the Redeemed deck where I threw a bunch of our the best heroic cards in there. She wants to be targeting stuff. Zada wants the heroic cards, all that kind of stuff. So I'm a big fan of Valiant. Uh, it's once per turn, the first time each turn mm-hmm. clause that really just kind of like keeps it from being like this dynamite ability, you know? Oh yeah, that once per turn has been tacked on so many cards that everyone's reading them and they're like, oh my god, it's so broken, and then they get to the once per turn and they just chuck the card. They're like, oh, okay, it's absolutely useless. <laughs> still, the the thing is, it's still good because it is once per turn, not per, not in, not once per turn cycle or until your next turn. Or on your turn. or Yeah, yeah. so you still can get it multiple times if you have... Uh, abilities that can target it, and because it opened it up to abilities, is what kind of still keeps it relevant in my mind. Right, right. But what do you think of Valiant? Sam? I don't care about it. You don't care about Valiant. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Uh, the last new mechanic is expend. Uh, expend. You expend. Pretty much everything has expend four. I think there's one that has expend eight. I think so. On yeah. it as well. Uh, you expend four as you spend your fourth total mana to cast spells during a turn. Notably, casting spells is something that you want to be doing. What? Generally yeah. speaking. Uh, did you know this, Wyatt? Did you know you wanted yeah, to Yeah, it's a, generally a good idea. Wow. Generally. Ah. Oh, generally. I've been playing this game all wrong. I know, right? <laughs> All right, uh, we'll look at uh, a common here. Baker's Bane Duo. It is a one and a green for a 2-2 Squirrel Raccoon. When it enters, you make a food token. But whenever you expend four, he gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Uh, another example here. Let's go with the Hoarder's Overflow. One and a red for an enchantment. Whenever Hoarder's Overflow enters, and whenever you expend four, you can put a stash counter on it. Then you can pay one and a red to sacrifice it, discard your hand, and draw cards equal to the number of stash counters on it. Uh, some of the some of these creatures are getting uh, indestructible. Some of them are getting counters. Some of them are putting counters on other things. Some are throwing some damage around. Exactly. So, in a game where they they've created now a keyword that says whenever you spend mana to cast a spell, you get a benefit. I feel like expend is way more powerful than some people might be thinking, and people just aren't. I feel like people aren't talking about it as much because the abilities that are tied to the the result you get out of expending four mm-hmm. for the specific cards printed are fine. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I think that it's a great way to kind of incentivize Magic the Gathering players because one of the things that all Magic players like to do is just do stuff for free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, not pay for it. Find ways to get around paying the mana cost. These are some of the most powerful spells, usually. Uh, and making a mechanic that's specifically, like, uh, enforcing or, like, giving you a benefit for actually spending that mana means you'll have to start looking at things in different ways. And I think that things like Wilderness Reclamation, uh, Seedborn Muse, mm-hmm. Bootlegger Stash, uh, anything that can, like, help you have like a really explosive turn where you're untapping all your lands and then tapping them and untapping them uh, or even generating more mana such as like a, I want to say it's Virtue of Strength the mm-hmm. one that you can tap lands for three times if they're yeah. basic or mm-hmm. uh, Nyx Bloom Ancient mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, cards like that are going to love it, it, the expend mechanic yeah. Uh, thankfully, it is only to cast spells and not activate abilities, because there are a lot of creatures that have very powerful activated abilities, which just getting more value off of them can be a bit redonkulous. Um, very good in limited environments. I feel like very good in standard, especially when you pair it with something like Offspring. Um, it, at, it tacks on an additional cost, so you are expending that amount of mana to cast spells. Mm-hmm. So you still get the expend triggers when you're using offspring to increase the mana, effectively increase the mana value of what you're casting. Uh, so that's a kind of fun synergy, at least for Bloomborough, like pre-release and uh, uh, limited or draft or whatever. Sure. Um, yeah, so you win twice. That's good business. <laughs> exactly. Not to mention, even though it doesn't specifically say expend, Glarb Calamity's Augur basically has expend on it, and that's one of the ones I'm very excited about 
Well, let's Glorb. let's let's just talk while we're here. Let's just talk about Glarb, okay? One of the big bads of the set. Hilarious, by the way. Black, green, blue for a two-four frog wizard noble legendary creature. He's got death touch. You can look at the top card of your library anytime. You may play lands and cast spells with mana value four or greater from the top of your library. You can tap them to surveil two. What a big bad. What a guy. I love the pose on that guy as well. He's oh, like yeah. lounging on his throne and shit. It's literally Tassiger the Golden Fang <laughs> pose over again, but as a frog. That's <laughs> awesome. And that's what makes it so good. It Plus, awesome. I love so much about this card being able to play lands off the top. It's mm. in fantastic colors to take full advantage of that. Um, mm. And you also get to surveil. So let's yeah. say you hit your land drop and the card right under it is a land. Tap it ditch the land, get to the next card. Even if it's another land, you dump two in the graveyard, you're also in green. And this is where all those cards I've talked about previously yeah. that mm -hmm. bring all your lands back from the graveyard. So I, I feel like Glarb is one of my favorites from the set so far. Absolutely. Not I've quite been... number one, but he's up there. He's he's pretty good. So at that point at this point I feel like we should just move on to some of the cards we want to highlight from this set. We've talked about the Absolutely. set mechanics. Talked about, talked about the color combinations, the creature types associated with them. Didn't really get into the strategies of them too much, but I mean, they're all pretty much the classics you would expect. Your is it otters is spell slinger, yeah. shocker. Your boros uh, mice are aggro, shocker. You know, the most interesting one is the simic cards are bounce and like yeah. flicker, yeah. which is interesting, but it kind of is underpowered in the set. But that's totally fine. Um, you always end up with one that's kind of meh compared yeah. to the rest. I love that the lizards are like hyper aggro. Yeah. That is one of my best things about the set. That is very thematic. So, uh, we talked about this on one episode of the Duels of Mana Dorks podcast where we were going over the season cycle. It's the mythic sorcery cycle uh, that have all the colors where you choose up to five paws worth of modes. Uh, we've been over all of them. I think we both agreed that the blue one yeah. was one of the stronger ones for drawing cards. Um, you create token copies, and then you can return non-land, non-token permanents to their bounce. Uh, that one was really strong. Green, I felt like, could be really strong as well. I feel like we discounted black a little bit, but it turns out I think black is one of the stronger ones. In, you discounted black. I discounted black. <laughs> in non-commander form... <laughs> In non-commander <laughs> formats, I feel like it is a little bit stronger uh, in one-on-one -on -one things. Uh, but what, yeah. did, what is your vibe on the season cycle? Obviously, white got gypped. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty uh, cool. I mean, white this set just... I, there's a couple things that stand out, but it's nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. But to me, uh, the red season was the one that I eyed the most because... Okay. Being able to create five treasures, I mean, tap. you've paid for the spell. They're Not only tapped, that, they're though. each... Hmm? They are tapped treasures, though. Yeah, you don't get to use them immediately. Right, but you still get five separate instances of artifacts entering. Mm -hmm. You get, uh, you can do things with Magda for that. You can trade yeah. in basically lands for artifacts. Now you have five treasures. Sack those and go into the combo. Um... There is an interesting thing with that Season of the Bold, the three paw print mode. Until end of, until the end of your next turn, whenever you cast a spell, Season of the Bold deals two damage to up to one target creature. That's that's an, that's an ability that's being activated from a card in the graveyard at that point. Yeah. yeah. Which is just I don't I don't know if we've really seen that before in this way of a whenever you do something while the card is in the graveyard, you get an effect. At least until the end of your next turn. So I think that's like an inter I, I think that's an interesting design space generally, because there are there are other games where you want something to not be in play. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that would be just like an interesting thing in general. Where it's like this card is like fine on the battlefield. It's whatever, but if you get it into your yard, then you're having like static things, and then it's like a target for graveyard hate. In yeah, a way. yeah. I think we. I mean, we've seen a cycle of like um, angers. I think the biggest one from that cycle. Ang if Anger's in the graveyard and you have a mm -hmm. mountain on the battlefield, all your creatures have haste, but... Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that the, that is a place that they can definitely expand into uh, uh, design-wise. I will say, though, specifically with the Season of the Bold, that three-paw mode, largely irrelevant. 
in yeah. most contexts. It's just an interesting design idea. Um, I still hold firm that the blue one is the best one. Uh, with the sure. green, with the green one shortly to follow. I mean, plus one plus one counters, draw a massive amount of cards, uh, destroy all enchantments or permanent. Like it, I really like that one. Um, but this, I feel the like the season of the bold is one of those ones that's gonna be perfect for like, is it storm decks? Imagine getting two or three copies of this, yeah. and you yeah. choose the dealing two damage to each creature, you've basically guaranteed that you've cleared the board. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only that, if you happen to have something like a Brash Taunter or a Stuffy Doll, you, you know, you can doll. turn that damage into direct damage. That is There's true. all kinds of ways to double up the damage you've dealt. They've continued to print things like that, so I will and instead now you're dealing four damage or eight damage, you know. I will say with that specifically, though, that it... I. In specific decks, Season of the Bold is going to be very strong. In general decks of the colors, I, decks. I still think blue and green are far and away the best. Obviously, we're not even going to kind of remotely talk about the white one. <laughs> you want some white, one man. <laughs> I mean, it does have the... I think the two-paw mode is pretty neat. Exile target non-land permanent. That Its controller gets to draw a card. Like, you can... Yeah. E I, I I just feel uh, white tries three, to be one, too one nice with their 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 stuff. They're like, hey, I got to get rid of this thing for you, but here's a card, here's a card, <laughs> or here's a treasure, you know. or you can put something onto the battlefield. It's okay. Great group, great group hug card. Um, yeah, it's still it, they're all still it's all still a powerful cycle. I will say. Yeah. Um. Oh yeah. I think they're I think they're pretty dece. Uh, there's the elemental big creatures the i'm there there's one of each color i, can't I think there's i think there's uh i think the red black. one uh well the i think the the dragon hawk is replacing the red one because i checked okay. for a legendary red elemental and there wasn't one that i saw okay. okay i do think that obviously the two that stand out are lumra bellow of the woods which is the elemental bear that's been doing what you've been talking about wyatt four green green for a star star elemental bear with vigilance and reach uh, when it, its power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control, when it enters, you mill four cards and then return all land from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Yep. Uh, so just making a very big bear, a lot of mill, just trying to get stuff into the yard. And then the one that's been memed around a lot is Ma... Ma -ha. Feather, it's Feathers Might, you know, from Amanda Show. Ma -ha. Yeah. Remember that? You watch Amanda Show? Uh, nope. You watch the Amanda Show? I did watch the Amanda show. I mean, Why? not very often, but... <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, Amanda, it's one, please. It's the one annoying character that nobody liked. Uh, yep. Maha, it's Feathers Might. Three black black for a 6-5. Elemental bird with flying and trample. Ward, discard a card. And then creatures your opponent's control have base toughness. One. Love it. No way that can be abused at all. No way. Oh, yeah. None. There's, we could just cut it right there. Pretty Terrible much. card. Uh, ward, discard a card. I think the special ward costs are better than just ward one or ward two or ward three mm -hmm. in general. Same. Both Same. In, both in a, I feel like in some ways they're more defensive, but they're also like, it creates an interesting choice for the person that's wanting to target it with something. Right. Like ward, sacrifice a creature is a, is can be a pretty big cost for you. It could you could have one creature on board, so you can't you effectively have hexproof from that player. Um, ward discard a card is like a big investment for two card of two cards effectively to remove a creature. Mm -hmm. um, but I ugh, one toughness, <laughs> one toughness with on its own in a mono black deck could be relatively fair. You start to add, like, basically any other color. You add white, you've got, like, negative one, negative one anthem effects. Um, you you add red, you've got all of the every cre deal one Beans. damage to every creature cards. Your, your um, oh my god. Tectonic Hazard from uh, Lost Cameras of Ixalan. There's the Midnight Hunt, or the Crimson Vow one, and the Festivities. That's what I was thinking of. Those two are the standout elementals in my mind. Oh, yeah. I agree. Visa I... stands out because of how bad it is. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, the white like, one. Like I, I wanted to like it because the artwork's so cool. It like is. the sunflowers, the elk, and then I read it and I'm just like, oh, it's a four mana four five. That's on rate. It is. <laughs> but then you go through and you just read this effect, and you know, blacks making all your opponent's creatures base toughness one. The dragon hawk is in red. You're getting all your lands back in green. And then this one's like, if your opponents control more than you, you can have something. Otherwise, if I do you're nothing. behind, here's a benefit. If you're more behind, yeah. here's a benefit. If you're really behind, here's a benefit. Yeah. It's a lot it's like, like this is a great catch up card, but on its mm -hmm. own, like when you're trying to like accelerate the game, like if you're the one that has the pedal down already, this does nothing. If you make it your commander, like if you were to build a commander deck around it, the only thing I could see being really good about this is if you played like self land destruction and then a bunch of blink spells. That way you're like always netting treasures. Yeah. And then you can kind of just get the other stuff by accident. But even still, I feel like it's not a great direction to take it. I agree. What's what's uh, uh, funny? I think funny is the right word. Is we love. Um, Oh god, now I'm forgetting the card's name. It's a white card. The sorcery card. I was the literally sorcery. just about to say it. Yeah, the uh, sorcery that says one in a white. If an opponent, it's basically the same. If an opponent has more life than you, gain two life. If an opponent has more uh, uh, creatures than you, create two white soldiers. If an opponent has more cards in hand than you, draw a card. We love that. Great card. It's a yeah. fine card. You like it a lot more than I do. You've run it. You run it in several more decks. I only have one copy of it. You only have one copy of it? I feel like you cast it against me all the fucking time. Yeah, Because <laughs> you always get like all from like the Vower. It's from Vower Midnight Hunt or something. Yes, like that. Yeah. correct. Yeah. And and on an, on a, at, at those effects for two mana is good. This effect yes. for four mana, not good. Yeah. Again, it might as well be a vanilla creature. Uh, nine, probably what seventy percent of the time. Yeah. All right. And again, unless you're doing something to actively break it, like why wouldn't you be doing that to the bear? It's such a hard to... build around too, yes. to break it, and it's not even really broken. It's just making parity. You can't break parity with that card. You get parity with that card. Yeah, you're just you know? you're playing five finger fillet, and you're intentionally chopping off your pinky to make this card work effectively you know, 100 yeah. percent of yes. the time. Yeah. All right, we're gonna, we're each gonna start pulling out some cards that we are really big fans of. Uh, we'll do that for a little while <laughs> until, we don't, until we don't really want to carry on. Until anymore. no one wants to do it anymore. Pretty much. Uh, I'm going to start with my Otter Planeswalker, Ral Crackling Wit. Pulled him, very thrilled, is already in a deck, huge fan. Two blue and a red. He's a mythic Planeswalker, Ral, with four starting loyalty. Whenever you cast, he has a static ability. Whenever you cast a non creature spell, you put a loyalty counter onto Ral Crackling Wit. His plus one creates a 1-1 one, one blue and red otter creature token with prowess. His minus three draws you three cards, and then you discard two cards. And the minus ten, draw three cards. You get an emblem with instants and sorcery spells you cast have Storm. For those of you that don't know, Storm is, when you cast this spell, you create a copy of it for every other spell that's been cast this turn. Not just your spells. Any spell that has been cast this turn has Storm. Also, there are plenty of Storm-based Is It decks that are going to be able to cast, what would that be, six, card, six cards in a turn to get him six loyalty more, and you can ult him on the first turn that he's down. Yeah. Um, I have him in Narset Enlightened Exile because there's a lot of non-creature casting going on. He's going to be able to plus himself up to create prowessy otters, which she really likes. Give them prow Effectively, with her on the battlefield, it's a 1-1 one -one otter with prowess prowess. And she casts a ton of non-creature spells. Really good. So two turns later, being, being able to ult him, and then suddenly all of the free casting I'm getting from her from the yard is stormed all the cards i'm cast like all the sorceries and instants from my hand are getting storm like that in addition the minus 10 also draws you three cards yeah <laughs> so if you're if it's not on the turn that you cast him if you have all your open mana and you're able to ult him suddenly now you've got a full grip a lot of cards and you're going to be able to s literally storm off with basically anything even something as simple as opt or consider when you're getting four copies of it for one mana is ridiculous. 
by oh, far yeah, my crazy favorite value. Card. Oh, dripping with value. Wyatt, we can never let him resolve that ultimate. Literally. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, never, 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 never. Wait. I'm one of those people that if I see a planeswalker, it's on sight. <laughs> All right? Uh, that planeswalker has to go. Punch the auto. I have, I have never let a planeswalker ult on me thus far in my magic <laughs> career. I'm not, I do not intend to ever let one resolve if I can help it. Yo, you're playing the bad Jace? Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck that Jace. I, I do not care. I, am, I, have to, I have to take it out. You're trying to minus my... to loot? Like, get out of here, man. Yeah, no, it's it's just one of those things in my head. I, I have, like, PTSD from one of the first times I went over and played with all my friends. They put together, like, a Super Friends deck. Oh. And I remember their whole point was to just put up a wall and ultimate off Planeswalkers. And from the moment I read one of them that was just, like, it just sticks around forever. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what do you mean? I can't target it? They're like, no, once it happens, it just happens. So yeah. I was like, all right, done. We're done. You don't need on to tell site. me anymore. Emblems yeah, specific On site. So you don't like Oathbreaker is what I'm hearing. <laughs> no. <laughs> I haven't played, but... Haven't? No, should I haven't we... built an, Oath, an Oathbreaker deck. You should make an Oathbreaker deck. It's pretty fun. I like the signature spell aspect of it, of having like a, a command zone instant or sorcery that you can always cast. I think that's fun. It's pretty cool. All yeah. right. Uh, Wyatt, what do you got? One of my personal favorite commander decks is uh, a pre-con called Symbiotic Swarm that had Cathril the Aspect Warrior. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys remember that. It was the 2020 commander decks. But basically, it's a legendary creature, Nightmare Insect. It's a 3-3, and it says when Cathril Aspect War Warper enters the battlefield, put a flying counter on any creature you control if a creature card in your graveyard has flying. Repeat this process for first strike, double strike, Death Touch, Hexproof, Indestructible, Lifelink Menace, Reach, Trample, and Vigilance. Yeah. Then put a plus one, plus one counter on Cathril for each counter put on a creature this way. I had to say all that because one of my favorites is uh, Shrike Force. I was going to say, is that where we're going? Yeah. Yeah, three mana for three keywords. I have like five or six mana cards in the deck that I try to get in the graveyard that mm -hmm. have the same wording just because of the wording they have, so... Being able to have that on a three mana body so I can cast it if I need to, great. Yeah, I mean, keyword soup creatures are just generally really, really good. <laughs> um, I'm thinking yes. the the something stoat. I can't remember. It's the one in a white that just has first strike and life. It's a one. It's a two mana two two that has first strike and lifelink, and that's just like a good card mm -hmm. to have. Uh, like, just on value stuff, and key, like, keyword soup is just big fan, big fan. Not what yes. I would have expected you to pull out as your very first top card. Well, I, I was doing this ahead of time, and I was like, you know what? I don't feel like a lot of uncommons and commons get a lot of love. That's true, that is true. A as the set progresses, especially in Commander, everyone's more focused on the splashy things. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Shrike Force, I was just like, this is a banger of a card. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For keyword soup. The moment you get more than two keywords on something, it's like the antenna comes up of like, <laughs> oh, what's going on here? How can I abuse this? How how can how can I commit violence? <laughs> yeah. All right. Because Same. flying double strike and vigilance, like it's a great blocker. You slap it has first strike damage and it flies. It flies I now. Mean, you can't you can't ask for you can't ask for much. Per, it's, <laughs> it's like much the more. perfect blocker. It can hit. It can. It, it flying does not evade. It. Basically, menace is the only thing that evades it. Death touch won't do anything because of double strike, and you're able to still attack with it. Because anybody want to slap some infect on that thing? Yeah. <laughs> let's do it. Let's put toxic five on it. Perfect. Fuck it. Why not? One shot. Anyway, Sam, you have uh, you have a black card here from yes. the Commander set, actually. Yeah, I'm going to call it uh, Hazel's Brewmaster from the Commander set. This is a three and a black for a three, four Squirrel Warlock with Menace. That's it. No. Um, That's all it is. Nice. Just three. No. Good keyword. Side note. <laughs> can we talk about how we've all adopted the format of name of card, mana cost, toughness power, power toughness, type line then abilities well i think that's generally how like every that's that, how, that seems like every creator that i listen to is exactly how they listen. 
Name, okay. mana, power, toughness, creature type abilities. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't know. I anyway. think it's just quickly. I think it's just a quick way to get it all off. So le- it's like the lexicon of of Magic: The Gathering. Like really, when you're yeah. describing a card, that's how you that's how you describe it to people, I guess. Yeah. Oh, it's a it's a four mana three four with menace. You know. Yeah. And and whenever Hazel's Brewmaster enters or attacks, exile up to one target card from a graveyard that and create a food token. Foods you control have all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with Hazel's Brewmaster. I forgot, this is the Agatha's Soul Cauldron. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of Agatha's Soul Cauldron, but also, you know, why not bust foods wide open? Uh, yeah. Thank the, the lords above they did not make this a legendary creature. <laughs> That would have been so fun. <laughs> that would be really fun. But you pointed out an interesting... Yeah, so, um, obviously, uh, 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 so it, since I can't run as a commander, what I would love to run as a commander is Sam uh, Sam the Loyal Attendant with Frodo, Adventurous Hobbit. Frodo gets to stay in the command zone the entire game and just chill. What I want Sam for is that reduction uh, in cost of activated abilities of food. Oh, look at that. A bunch of food have now a bunch of weird activated abilities. Mm-hmm. I mean, this thing already gives... If you ha- if you can exile a devoted druid, all your foods now tap for infinite green mana. Because um, a food token doesn't care about minus one, minus one counters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, that's yeah, what that's, I said. That's, and that is just oh, the man. that we're scratching right there. It's... It's nefarious. It's great. <laughs> yeah. And it, I, I really... It's like you would build that <laughs> Hobbit deck, but that's like the hidden commander. Yes, exactly. exactly. And that's really... Like, get get a lot... Like, in green and black, you've got plenty of good creature-based tutors to be able to grab it. Like, yeah. that... I feel like that could really start to get fucky very quickly. Oh, yeah. Add in some oh, yeah. mill to fill the graveyards for, for, you know, just for the sake of it. I love it. I hate anyway. it. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. <laughs> I hate it. Despise it, actually. Um, there are there are a couple that I want to bring up. I don't really have the specific. They're they're not like an archetype per se, but they're they've got a commonality between them. Uh, Kitsa Otterball Elite, one in a blue for a one three Otter Wizard. It has vigilance and prowess. Prowess, my favorite keyword. Tap, draw a card, discard a card. Mm-hmm. Pay two and tap. Copy target, instant, or sorcery spell you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. Activate only if Kitsa's power is three or greater. So you want to get the prowess procs off. You want to buff her up a little bit. Then you can copy things. At the very worst, you're able to tap her to loot. She's got vigilance, so you can still attack with her. Uh, And then there was the red uh, prowessy otter as well. Oh, I want to... Oh, where are you? Here you are. Uh, Nope, that was Emberheart. We already talked about Emberheart. Where are you? I can. Ne- I, that's my problem. I can never remember the name. I'm never. I'm never prepared. I apologize. But uh, yeah, Kitsa. Is, anything with prowess, obviously, I'm going to be thrilled for. There's a lot of very powerful otters with prowess, but Kitsa, I think, is like the yeah. elite amongst them. Would not run her as a commander. I think she belongs in the 99 of a mm-hmm. deck that cares about instants and sorceries because being mono blue instants and sorceries with with like you want to attack because she has prowess and vigilance. And then you want to copy things, and you also want to tap her to loot things, and I feel like it's better in a 99 environment. I agree. Yeah. But. That's just how some cards are. You know, you really want to make them work, but at the end of the day, you're just like, yeah, they just work better in the deck than, than heading it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wyatt, what do you got? I got Iridescent Vine Lasher. This card has stuck out to me because it's been a missing piece in this Enris Gloomstalker uh, agent of... Uh, it's not Agent of the Iron Throne. I think it's like Shadow Thieves or mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. deck that I have. But it's basically like a, land, a Golgari Landfall deck. And this just does everything I want. It's got Offspring, so I can make copies of it. And then whenever a land enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to target opponent. That's perfect because... The whole point of the deck is to play like the new Capenna lands. Mm. Yeah. And every time I gain life, I drain life. So it's basically a bunch of amalgamations of things that I gain life, you lose life. And on and a now, one mana, one two body is still very on right. rate. Yeah. 
total. It's crazy good. Um, I think my record right now with like land drops in a turn and a very early turn, um, I could probably get six. <laughs> that's so rude. That's I mean yeah if you if you have this thing on board and you and you have a even offspring that's that's twelve damage you just get to shoot somebody in the face with one person you can spread it across all three. Uh, I the the one thing that holds it back is his target opponent, not all opponents. That's kind of Red's domain in a yeah. lot of ways, but it's on landfall too. I yeah. I like I like that it that you're able to double up on this effect for only three mana across two bodies is is pretty great. Uh, yeah, no, that's it. That's a good one. There's the and there are ways to populate in the deck, so I can take. That's why I was so excited for the offspring because yeah. you can take that token, and now I just slowly <laughs> make more, and now I'm making land drops and dealing damage to everybody. Because once you get three, then you can just ping everybody, or focus one person down, or do whatever you need to do with it. Yeah, there is the. There's the also the. I, for one, I don't think we've even really addressed this that. The there's a lot of like one mana creatures that are available in this set that are really 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 fucking good. Um, okay, because I was thinking of there's the common lizard that's mono black one red one black mana for a one one with menace. I think it's the ravenous raider. Yeah, I think so. A one mana one one with menace that you can pay one and a black to give it plus one plus one until end of turn. And like there's just so so many great one drops in this set. That's definitely one of them. That's definitely one of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sam, what do you got? All right. Uh, I want to point out War and War Leader. Two white, white for a rabbit knight. A 4 4 rabbit knight. With offspring two. Whenever you attack, choose one. Create a 1 1 white rabbit creature token that's tapped and attacking. Attacking creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. Why it's populate face is going on. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, this is this is prime Selesnia colors. Just populate. You're you're making a huge army. You could go in Boros and now all these offspring tokens and everything else you make, you can usually give them haste. Yeah, and you're just building. battle cry is a thing, so you're adding to that. You're building a, just... a little board in a box. Yeah. I mean, well, yes. speaking of speaking of Selesnya, one card that loves it is the Burrowguard Mentor. It's the uncommon, uh, it's the signpost uncommon, green, white for Star Star, Rabbit Soldier with Trample. It's power and toughness equal to the number of creatures you control. And then, ooh, do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? I think I have it. Yes. Uh, Her Head of the Homestead, the three Selesnya Selesnya for a 3 2 Rabbit Citizen, enters, create two 1 1 right rabbits. Get all the rabbits. Yeah. All the Get rabbits. all the synergies. Yeah. All just, the synergies. Just go rabbit. Go rap. Oh. Oh. But yeah, I mean... Hop, hop to it. There's, okay. a re there's a reason that the War and War Leader is a mythic. Uh, it's repeatable, yeah. and it's across two bodies. It's uh, it's a shame that... It's a shame that it, the offspring is going to be a 1-1, one, one, so it's a little bit harder, harder to attack with that. But I feel like in this kind of a strategy where you're trying to populate your tokens, you're going to have your Anthem effects... And yeah. the war leaders themselves also are can function as an anthem effect in addition to growing a board state. And it's just whenever you attack, so you don't even have to attack with these creatures. Oh my god, I thought it was when this creature attacks. Okay. Yeah, no, those are really good. <laughs> Alright, my strike force is going in, and so now I'm going to get plus one, plus one across two times. All the populates, hey. all of them. All the populates, all the Extra populates. combat All the populates, extra. all the populates. And extra. All right. Um, there's only one more that I really want to talk about. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's like a million things that I would like to talk about. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, oh gosh. Okay, there's kind of two that I want to talk about. <laughs> uh, one of them. I'll, one of them. I'll go quickly. Uh, Igra, eater of all. Three black green. It's the elemental cat. Six six. Ward sacrifice of food. Other creatures are food artifacts in addition to their other types. Uh, they have the cl and then they gain the classic pay two tap sacrifice the permanent gain three life, uh, and whenever a food is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you put two plus one plus one counters on Igra Eater of all. Uh, Ward sacrifice of food sounds super limiting, but when Igra's on the battlefield, all your everything creatures is a food. everything is a food. So there you go. Uh, that one. I just imagine someone slamming this and then immediately going into um, Bane of Progress. 
and just wiping, wiping the board all... and getting all the tokens. I mean, getting all the counters on it. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I could see oh. that. People have been people have been uh, beside themselves with that. But the one I'm beside myself with is the good frog boy, Helga, skittish seer. I guess the good frog girl, Helga, skittish seer. Green, white, blue for a 1-3 frog druid. Whenever you cast a creature spell with mana value 4 or greater, you draw a card, gain a life, and put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on Helga. You can tap her to add X mana of any one color where X is her power. You can spend this mana only to cast creature spells with mana value 4 or greater, or creature spells with X in their mana value. I like... Wonderful. No notes. No notes. <laughs> no notes. Beautiful. Color combination? Yeah. The color combination is beautiful. Zero, zero problems with this card. Uh, I like it from the perspective of like the anti CEDH card. Because CEDH falls into fucking mid range hell and combos all the time. What colors are really good at stopping combos? White and blue. What mm -hmm. colors are really good at getting big fuck off creatures that are going to be able to trample through? and kill all of these boards of combo attempts. Three. And she draws you cards, and she gains you life, and she rams you. There's just so much to love. I mean, you got... It's so you can go with a proliferate style, where mm -hmm. you just get one counter on her, and then you just start to grow her. There's all kinds of four mana and above creatures that when they enter, they untap another target creature, so you could probably chain through somehow and just make her bigger and, and bigger as you continue to cast things. And that's not even to mention the myriad of like one mana cantrip combat or uh, combat tricks in specifically blue and green that are like like uh, what was it? Snakeskin veil mm -hmm. plus one plus one counter hexproof untap it. Uh, shore yep. up plus one plus one hexproof untap it. Like there's a suite of cantrip uh, cantrip based protection specifically that are going to make her bigger and then let her tap for more mana. So if someone's targeting her with removal, you can tap her to float the mana, untap her, give her hexproof, increase her power and toughness, either permanently or temporary, and then tap her again to even get something bigger off, mm -hmm. uh, throwing in like a couple of big fuck off X creature spells. Uh, you're going to be cramming like your crater hoof behemoth. Uh, the white Crater Hoof Behemoth uh, clone that we got in Wilds of Eldraine, whose name is escaping me. You can play both of them as like big finishers that are going to want all of the mana that she can produce. I want to say it's like Midnight Cavalry. Yes, yes. So like you're going to have like those two as big finishers. You're going to be able to get a lot. You can if you just get a sizable board mm -hmm. against like these like comboy decks. If you got even if you're you're creating like a stacks build in a way. Uh, getting like a Dranith Magistrate out, get it, like just things that are slowing everyone down from being able to combo off, and then suddenly all of your stacks piece creatures are going to be like seven seven trampling fuck off creatures that are just going to completely destroy everything. And then when you start casting the, the you're able to. I, I, I love everything yeah. that she wants to do. I'm a big fan. Absolutely. I'm a big fan. I want to get I want to get like a proper regular CEDH deck and get used to the gameplay flow of higher power EDH specifically so I can try and build her to fuck all of them over. <laughs> fuck Blue Farm. Uh, uh fuck fuck anything with Timna, anything with Crom, anything like just all of them. Be gone. Rogsai. Rogsai, uh Sakashima, Krark Sakashima. Anything Sakashima, really. <laughs> I mean, you're in white, so Draineth Magistrate alone does that. Yeah. Like, you get that out early enough, everyone else is like, okay, we gotta get rid of the Draineth. It's gotta, gotta go. Like, and Stax is, like, not super powerful in CEDH right now, but having that, having, like, a Stax sub-theme in the correct colors... Uh, like in, even even in green, white, blue, there's still combos that you would be able to pull off while restricting the less the rest of the table and and controlling them. Uh, and there's it in, CEDH has so many like very powerful one and two mana creatures, and there's really powerful like four and five mana creatures that aren't really being played because it's difficult to cast them and it's just not mana efficient. Whereas 
she makes it mana efficient by being a dork that can help to cast those higher value things. And then also she gets bigger, you draw a card, you gain a life when you do it as well. Yeah. So big fan of Helga. Big fan. Big fan. That those are all the cards I have to talk about. Wyatt Sam, what do you got? I got uh one that I've already made a deck about. Um Castrol the Windcrested. It's the legendary bird scout that whenever one or more birds you control deal combat damage to a player, you get to choose one. You can put a bird creature card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield with a finality counter, put a plus one, plus one counter on each bird you control, or draw a card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Classic bird. That birds. is so good because I saw the finality counter and I was like, oh, well, I'll just, you know, you can blink it. You have things to take counters away to draw cards. Uh, plus one, plus one counter on each bird. I mean, we've already talked about Shrike Force. Mm -hmm. That's a double striking bird. Now you're giving it counters. Mm -hmm. And you're drawing cards. There's just so much to love. Even though it's five mana, it's a five mana four five with flying. Yeah. yeah. You're probably going to have setup. so as soon as it comes down and you swing with something else that's a bird yeah. because you're just loading the deck with birds, you're going to be able to draw. And there's actually a surprising number of really good other birds in these colors, like mm -hmm. Yorion. Yeah, uh, the companion that blinks everything. So if you have a field full of creatures with finality counters, well, Yorion comes down, and all of a sudden they no longer have finality counters. Yeah, that birds are an interesting thing because it feels like there's always being pieces printed mm. for Azorius birds specifically, but n it's very rare to find like one that kind of just like is like no this is the one that we want to lead this yeah. and this is probably one of the closest ones we've gotten to that kind of the weird thing power. with a lot of birds and even bird like legendary birds is they all their big thing is giving flying to other creatures which doesn't work great as a bird commander because birds already have flying yeah <laughs> yeah yeah like the that was one of the things i had to cut out a lot is because when i was going through all the cards and everything, I'd be like, oh, this creature gives plus one, plus one counters, I'll put it in there. It's like, it gives a plus one, plus one counter and flying to target creature without flying. Yeah. And I'm like, well, everything has flying, so that's yeah. useless to me. Yeah. Air Force. Air Force. Air Force. You already made this deck? Yeah. Uh, I don't have it in paper. I made it on um, okay. uh, Moxfield. Is it one of your, but is it one of your, your typical Gemini $20 deck tech videos? It is under twenty dollars. It is seventeen dollars and four cents. <laughs> I love it. Is this a is this a preview for a future video, possibly? It could be if I quickly get the script out and <laughs> the editing done. Fair enough. Fair enough. Can you call the deck "The Chickens Will Roast You"? I called it Alfred Hitchcock. I that's, that was going to be my <laughs> second option, actually. Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right, Sam, close us out. What do you got? Last one. Let's end on something toxic. The Rotten Mouth Viper. It's a, it's a 5 and a black for a 6-6 six, six elemental snake. As an additional cost to cast this spell, you may sacrifice any number of non-land permanents. This spell costs one less to cast for each permanent sacrifice this way. Whenever Rotten Mouth Viper enters or attacks, put a blight counter on it. Then, for each blight, blight counter on it, each opponent loses four life unless that player sacrifices a non-land permanent or discards a card. Delicious. I, I hate it. There's so much I love about this card. I hate it. I love snakes, so that was already something it had going for it. It's a 6-6. Six, six. You can get it out really early. There are ways to proliferate in black, so you can increase those blight counters, but, I mean, it's already going to be very oppressive. Yeah. There's so many ways to benefit from not only you discarding, but your opponent's discarding. Like, if you play this with something like Tegrid, you know, now when they sacrifice, why, why you get it. Why are we speaking so much sin it, into the it. podcast? What is, what is with all the sinning that's happening, boys? Look, it's it's very simple. <laughs> if, you're, if you have a Tegrid player in your pod, this goes out to anyone who has a Tegrid player in their pod. We do. Just play we things do. that return permanence to yourself. Homeward Path. Yeah. There's other cards that do it, like Brand or something like yeah. that. That way, even if they get it, guess what? You get it right back. Hey, I'm not counterplaying the Turgrid. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. 
I'm gonna play things that want shit in the graveyard. Okay? I want I'll play aristocrats. I'll play I'll play go I'll play I'll jund it up jund before I would fight the Turgid player directly, because fuck them, they don't deserve that. <laughs> they don't deserve that satisfaction to know that I put a card in their deck specifically for them. I like this card. Yeah, it's I would it's really, a really good card. It sins. I would really it sins love so deeply. I would really love to put one in my Sauron the Necromancer deck. Well, ooh, let's let us let us let's game it out here. For one, thank God it's not a legendary creature. Yeah, it's thank not, God it's, it's not, not a legendary. legendary creature. That's true. That makes it even better. <laughs> kind of. Um, let's say you're in Rakdos, for example. We could say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many ways are there to give your creatures haste? At least. Too many, several. numerous. At least too many. Like, several. Five? You're able to put this creature down. Yeah. You deal four damage to everyone. You make them discard a card. Immediately attack with it. Deal everyone eight damage now. And discard two more cards. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to leave that there. I'm just going to leave that there for whatever it's worth. Whatever people want to make of that. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it goes very well in Rakdos, like, um, you're kind of, ooh, 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 I'm trying to, I'm working on this deck. What am I on about? What am I on about? Fucking, oh, oh, yes. Judith, Carnage Connoisseur. Judith, no. Give your instance and sorceries <laughs> death touch or Love life that. link, or you cre and you create the one one or the two two imps that deal two damage to each opponent. I'm building her as, um... Lots of small board wipes, like your end of the festivities and stuff, uh, coupled with the your Tesse, your your Kessig flame breathers, your firebrand archers that are just pinging everybody. Uh, that's what this does. In addition to, <laughs> in addition to forcing your opponents to discard cards, in addition giving you giving you a way to get rid of all these 2-2 two -two imps that you might be making with Judith as well to sacrifice, ping everyone for a lot, and then reduce the cost of. Disgusting. I love it. I love Beautiful. it. Beautiful. I love it. That, this, is my, this is my sinful deck that I'm working on. And it's only, it's only this big so far. She's just yeah, a little... I, I... Once you build those once, I pulled a um, and I you kind of get over it because... Oh. You you play it against other people enough, and they're just like, uh, I don't I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. Like I I don't want to play against that anymore. Can do you have anything else? Because it turns out people like having casting stuff. their cards and you know having yeah. stuff on the field. They don't want it in the graveyard. So, but uh, real real quick, speaking of that Sauron mm -hmm. and the Blightfang, mm -hmm. Promise of Aklazots is something I've found yeah. super powerful in a lot of. Uh, things that include black where I'm trying to populate simply because at the beginning of your end step you may sacrifice a non-demon creature if you do populate. Perfect. Oh, Perfect. In there. Oh. At close Ooh. And, and it's six cents. <sighs> Fuck. Yep. 50 cents. 50 cents. That's, that's what I had in mind with the iridescent uh, vine yeah. lasher because yeah. I have that in that deck specifically so I can make these tokens. Mm -hmm. And, and just go to town. Oh my god, I forgot one card that I have to bring up. Okay. Sorry, it's Stargaze. Oh, I, I must, I must, uh, yeah. Uh, look, I'll, I'll, give, uh, uh, I'll give Wyatt my, uh, my adoration later for t pointing me towards this card. Yeah, go that's on. a very good card. <laughs> that's a very good card. It's two mana. That's, it, it's two mana? Yes, it what? is two mana. It's an enchantment. Christ. I'm gonna populate a Gary token so many times. Oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah, because that's what I'm here for. Because Sauron makes them wraith tokens. Yeah, with three three wraith tokens yep. with menace. Fuck! I already I, score. Go team. That's a great. That's a great card for Sauron. It's so stupid good. Um, Check out typical Gemini giving you the budget spicy <laughs> tech that your decks need. Literally though. Literally though. Typical youtube.com slash typical Gemini. Um, but. The Stargaze. Stargaze from Bloomboro. Yes. It is X black black for a sorcery. You look at the top you look at twice X number of top the top cards of your library. So if X equals four, you look at the top eight. You then put four into your hand and you lose four life and the other four go in the or the other four go on the bottom. I should have pulled this up. Uh X X black black. 
you're you're going to even for modest x values uh like x equals two it's a four mana sorcery you're looking at four cards you're putting two into your hand you're losing two this is a 34 cent sorcery it's uncommon i'm telling you right now i had one copy of it in my pre-release deck that we played on monday night magic yeah uh that card does fucking work even for two x equal two that card does crazy amounts of work for selection. Yeah. And if you're dumping six mana, seven mana total into that fucker, like you're going to be digging so far, you're going to be getting a lot of cards, and you're losing what four life? Yeah. Irrelevant. Pretty good. Life is a resource. L- keep an eye on that card. Keep an eye on that card. It is under fifty cents. I'm telling you right now, most any black deck is going to want that card, like a lot. Oh yeah. Also, shout, shout out to the Fountain Port Bell as well. One mana artifact, ETB, put a basic land. You may put a basic land on the top, and then you pay one and you sack it to draw a card. Highly recommend. Anyway. Uh, I just want to talk sense. about one more card. Yeah, go for it. Because it's, it's not good, but it just it's my favorite looking card from the set, and its flavor text is just... Uh, it's Cinder and Cutthroat. Um, Lizard Assassin... And the flavor text is, we don't play with fire. It is strictly business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Good and job. it just looks like a Rakdos cultist. It, it, it really it looks so good. It really does. It really does. Uh, it enters with a plus one, plus one counter on it. If an opponent lost life, you can pay one in Rakdos to give it menace. No, that's good. That's really good. I think that's a good note to end it on. I agree. I agree. So, final thoughts, gentlemen, on Bloomborough. I think it's going to be the best set of the year. I am holding out just a little bit of hope for Duskmorn because I'm a huge horror fan, mm-hmm. uh, and already seeing like the Poltergeist reference yeah. has me set kind mm-hmm. of up here for it. But out of set so far this year, this has won some of the m- most exciting Commander cards I've seen thus far. It's really gotten me like thinking about different ways I can brew certain things, yeah. not just with Castrol, but like Vren the Relentless. Uh, Mirror in the Trash Tactician, as I said, Glarb, Glarb, Glarb. Uh, Gev. There's so many, so many good legends. Oh, we didn't even bring up so Flubs just... the Fool, even. <laughs> Flubs, you fool! <laughs> that one's just that one's just actively like here. I'm bad, but some value. <laughs> I love that's. It. I'm te- I'm calling it. That will be one of the ones people break because oh, yeah. uh, Song man. of Creation. I want to say. Yeah is another card that does the same thing and if you're drawing spell like every time you're drawing a card every time you're casting a spell doesn't matter just any spell mm-hmm. you're gonna churn through double land drops i mean there's just it, it's one of those things that i think a lot of people see the downside it's non-deterministic storm yeah in a way but yeah that one that one will be fun um but again commons and uncommons it's great all around the art love it mm-hmm Everything, high notes, high notes, high notes, high notes. High notes. High notes. Yeah, I'm a big fan of this set. Um, you know, going through the past set, the sets we've gone through this year, we talked about this earlier when on the regular podcast. We we've all, we've opened packs, and we've got packs ready to open for an end of year limited chaos game. Mm-hmm. And I think of the sets that we've had this year, this is the one that I'd be most excited to continue to open packs for. Yeah. Um, whether that's you know, just as a, as a draft, as a limited, or just a little treat. Um, I, I think we can all agree we're not really factoring in Modern Horizons 3 because it is objectively more powerful and more expensive and a little bit more cost prohibitive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think objectively Modern Horizons 3 is the best set simply because the cards are the most powerful. Yeah. But right. Bloomborough, I think, is the best set. Uh, Modern Horizons didn't have Hive Spine Wolverine, which is a Wolverine that just has a beehive on its back. So no, no, it didn't. I think Bloomboro has that going but, for it. But Bloomboro didn't have Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. Like, it's true. It Thunder didn't have Dungeon the Holy Cow. Mm. It didn't have the Holy It did not have the Holy Cow. Holy Cow. It did not. It did not. It also did not have the, the, um, the, the, oh my god, Scooby-Doo. But Cash Grab oh. guys. The Scooby-Doo guys. 
the the meddling youths. The meddling youths. What's the name of the organization that they are? Mystery Inc. Mystery Inc. I, I got the fucking mystery van or the mystery mobile, whatever the fuck they call it, and I got Scooby- the mystery machine. Mystery machine. There we go. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> My son is in a huge Scooby Doo phase. That's we'll allow it. I mean, who who among us isn't? Yeah. Yeah. I too like to build sandwiches that are this tall. I mean, yeah. Love. I love the live. Growing action. up, I. I thought that that for sure was a real thing. <laughs> so I was highly disappointed when I ordered a po' boy and it was like, like a this normal, big. like you could fit your mouth around it. If, if you ever go, yeah. have a chance to go to, um, I'm sure it's many Jewish delis, but Shapiro's in Indianapolis, mm. it's a Jewish deli and they, when they serve you a sandwich, it's about that tall. Yeah, it's a, it's a thick boy. It's a thick boy. It's a thick boy. I know a lot of good delis in Baltimore do that kind of shit too, where it's like, oh, that's like six inches tall. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, Wyatt, thank you so much for joining us. Wyatt is Typical Gemini over on YouTube and uh, TikTok, all of the other socials. Would you, got, you got anything you want to pump? Any videos that you've just released or about to release, anything like that? Um, I released a Braids Arisen Nightmare. That was uh, a few weeks ago. I was on vacation, and I'm about to release a Cherix the Raging Isles deck that I'm pretty stoked about. It's um, a weird Voltron strategy that... Uh, where you're trying to give him defender so you can use other cards to help him attack with his toughness. Mm-hmm. It's it's a pretty good deck. I, I I don't want to toot my own horn. I was actually pretty <laughs> pretty proud of putting that one together. Two, three. And it was like sixteen bucks. So mm-hmm. So why it's definitely that. Why it's big claim to fame, of course, is the twenty dollar and under deck techs for EDH. Love that. I would try my best. I would I would never be able to build under that kind of a under those conditions. In a normal sense. That's, that's why I build PDH decks for my budget brutes. Yeah. <laughs> Big fan. See, that's the thing. Like, pe- people all the time, when they say they build budget decks, I'll go check out their, their stuff because, you know, content creators support other content creators. And whenever I look at their budget, they're like, oh, it's $50 and under. I'm like, I could build a deck for $50. You know, that's Not you're hard. just taking all the good stuff. Yeah. And, you know, try, try getting under that. You know, that's all I think about. Think about the average guy. Those are the, the. What about the family guy? Those average guy decks are the kinds of ones that I always want to reference when I'm building a deck because I'm like, you know, if you go on Moxfield and you're like, I want to see this commander, and it'll be like, Mega One Shot Kill, no bad things, three thousand dollars <laughs> for a for fucking Shao Jun, and then yeah, like what Assassin's yeah. Creed, and then one of the tags is casual, casual. It's like, yeah, yeah well. $3,000 casual decks don't exist, in my opinion. I agree. But anyway, anyway, you can check out Wyatt over on YouTube. Uh, typical Gemini. Big fan. Thank you very much for coming on and joining us. Uh, we're sad that you can't join us at Gen Con. Very sad. How dare you be a father with I'm a life that I and job. Either. I know. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. But we will meet at a con one day. One better. day. One day. But we will. Again, be doing this again in about a month for Duskmorn. Duskmorn House of Horror, yes. We'll be doing it for for that set. We'll do it for Foundations as well and whatever random shit they come out with in the meantime. Anyway, yeah. this has been a long just one. Just a side tangent real quick. Ooh. Just I'm trying to – I'm sorry no, to try to put us, this Put us in the side. Part. Are either of you horror fans? I'm a fan of a horror. That's not true. I, I, I'm not. I am un, – I'm a fan of Uncanny. But not necessarily like horror. I think okay, okay. My problem is that a lot of like horror movies are just like not very well or logically made. Like there's a couple that I think are good, but I just I can't get a like. Some people really enjoy the camp. Mm-hmm. I str- w- specifically with scary and horror movies, I struggle to get over the camp of it sometimes. You know, and that's just. I mean, that's just me. Some of them are purposefully made that way, exactly. and that makes them good, and then. Usually, you see more camp with, like, the older ones mm-hmm. or movies that are, like, you know, doing, like, a hand-and-fist type thing where it's like, we know that this is campy, but it's purposefully this way. Uh, but other than that, I feel like horror is just, it's it's so good because it can encompass so many things. Yeah. It can be horror comedy. It can be a thriller. Uh, and my wife is a, a huge horror fan, so I kind of, by proxy, have... You've absorbed You've that. You've learned a lot from her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. fair. Dustmorn, I think, is going to be cool. I like the art treatments that they're doing for a lot of them, like the t- like the retro like uh, CRT TV kind of vibe. 
big fan. And anyway. So, yeah. Anyway. That is about all the time we have today for bonus action, a Duels and Mana Dork supplement podcast. Uh, Bloomberg review. What, what, what would we give this this set out of 10? I'd give it an 8.5. I give it a 9 paws out of 10. Oh, nine, ooh, nine, nine paws. paws. Okay. Nine paws, yeah. Uh, I will I will go with an 8.75. Just be right down the middle. All right, cool. Love that. Thank you very much, Wyatt. Again, we'll have you on soon. And as always, we love you very much. And peace. Signing out.